and welcome everybody to my little talk that I called a safer elixir. So this is kind of like um, some summary of all the things that I learned, you know, when starting working with Elixir and what I found, you know, interesting and some sort of like good practices in order to make a safer Elixir. So first of all, um, let me give you a little side notes about myself. So I'm based in Ecuador. I currently live in Quito. I currently have more than three years in software development. I'm really fond of functional programming and, you know, type of languages, which, you know, Elixir is not itself a strongly typed language, but it's functional programming. You know, other languages that I also like and enjoy is, uh, um, sorry, Haskell, uh, OCaml, things like that, you know, um, also TypeScript as well. And in my free time, I enjoy landscapes. So I, I really, really, you know, enjoy morning walks and cooking itself. So with further ado and after introducing myself a little, let's get into the agenda of what I'm going to talk about today. So not going to go you know, really in depth in all these topics, but first of all, I would like to give a little introduction about how is you know, Mix able to help us build a safe file elixir, right? After that, I'm going to talk about the feature I like the most in Elixir, that you know it's pattern matching and guards, and how we can use that to build a better Elixir. Following up on that, I would like to talk more about the structs, the benefits of the structs in Elixir, and how can we use them in order to build a, bit, a safer Elixir. And finally, and you know, as always with software, some minor caveats or considerations that we should have into account when using these patterns that I'm going to explain to yourself in this in this quick talk. So first of all, as I was saying, let's talk a, a little about Mix, right? So as you may know, El Mix, sorry, is the Elixir's build tool that allow us to create projects, you know, manage dependencies, run tasks, and even more, right? With that in mind, you know, the first thing that I would like to mention is that, you know, we can compile our project dependencies uh, separately from our code, right? So we could have the following command in our and in our CLI, you know, to compile the dependencies and then furthermore, to compile our project code itself. So for now, we will just going to introduce you a little example with this little module, you know, called my module. And we're going to greet, you know, something, a pet in this case. And we're going to run through that same set of commands, right? And, you know, that's a success, right? Because it's something quite simple, nothing so complicated. The code compiles just fine, right? Now, moving on forward with that, we're going to introduce two things, right? Something that's well known in software development, like, you know, an unused variable or calling a variable that doesn't exist. Then we're going to try to compile our code. So now that we have that in place, and after compiling our code, we're going to run into some interesting stuff. So, First of all, I would like to mention two things, right? That it's not well known or common for dynamic languages like Elixir. So Elixir functionality allow us to expand, you know, or try to have like a fallback scenario when it doesn't find something in our code, in, sorry, in our, in our code and it's trying to compile it, right? So first of all, you know, we change this variable or we're trying to use this variable named pet and it doesn't exist, right? So it's trying to expand it to a function without, argu without arguments, right? And the second one is that we have this unused variable called, um, you know, redundantly not used variable. And the compiler is already telling that to us. And what's important about this part is that we have a compilation error, right? Because we have an, we're trying to use a non-existent variable or function called pet. So that's the first guard or what I'd like to call a guard in relation to Elixir's compiler, right? Or furthermore, how Erlang also works, you know, trying to expand things that, you know, the compiler doesn't find and allow us to try to help like this follow-up scenario that I was mentioning before. Furthermore, and more specific to Mix, what's important from, from my experience is, you know, treating these warnings as errors, right? And we have two ways to do this. The first one is, you know, this, uh, this option when compiling our code, this flag called warnings as errors. And that's going to do explicitly what it says, right? You know, we are going to treat warnings as errors. Um, but, you know, sometimes this gets tricky and you can know, well, not everyone is fond of using the REPL or using the CLI. 
So maybe you want to take it further down into your code. And you can also try to put this as a compiler option in your specific project settings, right? So with this in mind, and with this little configuration, the one that's more bold, we said we say to the Elixir compiler to treat warnings as error as well. And with this, um, you know, uh, with the example that I gave you before, this is kind of like, um, it's pretty simple. It's pretty straightforward, but it also helps us to treat different things, right? And, you know, taking more into account, uh, like further steps about this, you could end up with, you know, uh, with less dead code in your application and with other kind of benefits that we're, that we're going to continue talking through this, this little talk. Now, we're going to introduce that to, to show you how you can get rid of that code, sort of, or from on, not unused variables, right? So with this configuration to treat warnings and errors, we are going to introduce a second variable in our little function called boom, right? So what's boom going to do when we try to compile it? Uh, this is like a little reference that, you know, our code is not going to compile, and that's what it's actually going to do, right? So when treating these warnings as errors, we are going to have the same similar message to what we had before, right? That, you know, this variable is not being used. And we, with this specific flag for, you know, our project in this case, it's going to fail, right? So we're going to get like this stop sign when trying to compile our code. And that's the first step on building a, a safer Elixir, in my opinion. Moving on. Um, this is the feature that I like the most in Elixir personally. Um, pattern matching and guards is, I think it's one of the best things that Elixir could bring to us, right? So let's get more into it. So pattern matching, um, I'm not quoting this from Elixir School. Uh, it allows us to match simple values, data structures, and even functions, right? But that's not where Elixir ends up, you know, with this pattern matching functionality. We also find this pattern matching functionality at least exhaustively in our control structures, right? You know, in case structures, in with structures, you can also make some sort of pattern matching mechanisms in other control structures, like if statements, unless statements, and so on, right? So basically, in Elixir, you can do pattern matching everywhere, right? And this is something really cool, in my opinion, or something really helpful, right? Because it allows us to be more expressive with our code itself. Right, so you can express better in which conditions certain functions are going to work, handle polymorphism, and more features right like right. I'm kind of related to this and not trying to get really away from you know the, this topic. That sort of how you know uh, on, on how polymorphism works in Elixir, right? Via protocols, right? It kind it's similar to a exhaustive pattern matching mechanism, but we're allowing different structures to adapt to this pattern matching mechanism in order to work differently or to have a different implementation. So with that in mind, we are going to introduce some pattern matching in our code, right? So for this time, we're just going to greet a specific um, animal or a pet, you know, a dog. So we're going to tell the dog when it comes into our function, woof, woof. Otherwise, we're going to greet it like, you know, like it's something unknown for us, right? But at, up, up to this point, it doesn't feel like you're, you know, you know, we're completely safe, right? Because you know we're using the fallback scenario for, uh, in this case, for the string protocol, and the, so the string charts protocol, in order to turn everything that comes into our grid function as a string, right? So, in my opinion, this is still feels a little odd. Of course, you know, it's going to work. It's probably not going to crash depending on the complexity of the variable that's going to come in into our function, but it's still not safe enough. We probably need to introduce more things here in our code in order to make it safer, or at least, you know, to make it more aware of what are the things that you know should be on the happy path or what should be considering in order to give better error messages to, you know, probably to some API consumers API clients, and so on and so on. So this leads me to introduce a concept that is more similar to other languages. So what's called a partial function, right? Um, to give you a high level idea of what's a part of a partial function, sorry. It's a function that it doesn't consider every case or every scenario that it's going to work, right? And as I was mentioning before, for, for now, we're assuming that pet is going to be whatever. 
in our function, you know, regardless, an integer, and a string, a map, a list, a keyword list, and so on and so on, right? So we're not going to introduce these like specific behaviors for all the cases that we would like to work with in our function, right? Uh, which in some sort of case, or uh, almost in every case, it's fine, right? Because that's why we depend on protocols, on polymorphism, on more stuff in Elixir, right? But it's not always the safest thing to do. Because, you know, um, sometimes our code, and most of the times in our code, we depend on the happy path, right? And we would like to cover at least the ideal, if not perfect, scenario for our functions or our code to work. So moving on forward with that, we're going to be using a different, but not completely a side con uh, concept in Elixir that's called the guards. So with that in mind, oh, sorry, I am think I'm, oh, there we go. <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, with that in mind, we're going to be guarding our code even more with what we want to work with. So for this particular scenario, we're always, or we always want the pet variable to be a binary, right? In that case, we're going to be sort of safer when we want to work only with binaries. Um, to give you a, a little explanation, by is binary is kind of like a wrapper function from an Erlang model that allow us to check if the code is a binary string or is a string per se or an UTA beta string in order to work, right? And what Sagar telling in our code is, you know, when we want to greet this pet variable and when it's only a binary or when it's only a UTF-8 string, then we are going to output the following results. And then we have the final scenario that will, will take into consideration a complete function and not a virtual function, right? So by using the underscore, you know, that's kind of like the fallback scenario for, hmm, this is something that we were not aware or we were not expecting in our code. We are going to return, oops, that's not an string. And in this case, we're covering basically all the scenarios that could happen. You know, we have the first, I would say the first explicit or the first uh, specific scenario for the variable. Then we are going to consider only strings for this variable. And then for whatever else comes into our function, we have this fallback scenario. Instead of having um, like this fallback scenario that also the code allow us, you know, that we try certain patterns or these specific patterns in your function. So, you know, we didn't have anything expecting for this specific pattern. So basically we're going to crash in a more like uh, graceful way, right? But this is some sort of like uh, a specific way to handle errors for all the other scenarios that we were expecting. Um, what I want trying to say with this stop, <laughs> the stop sign is what guards actually tell us to do, right? For our code specifically, right? So when it's not covered by a specific pattern matching in our different uh, variables, and we have guards in place, and they don't fulfill these guards or these conditions that could be inside of our guards, they are, trying, they are going to tell their code to stop, to stop trying to find these patterns and fall back to the specific or to the, well, you know, to the catch all the scenario that we have on the final function. With that in mind, you know, we're going to take it to the next step and we are going to be making more pattern matching and in, uh, sorry, uh, using with hand with our guards, right? So we're going to introduce pattern matching to keyword lists and to map structures or to map data structures per se. So in the third, in the third scenario, we're going to be pattern matching a keyword list that contains the key pet. And we're going to make sure that that variable or that key is a binary, right? So we are just going to fall back to our, you know, to our binary function of pet. Furthermore, we can still be performing more pattern matching um, with our map. So we're going to make sure that our map comes with the key pet as well. And also that that bit variable is going to be a binary, right? So we fall back once again to our grid scenario. And finally, we have uh, once again, our fallback scenario that's called, that's not a string, right? And with that in mind, again, that's basically one of the core functions that Elixir has, right? Exhaustive pattern matching, but that's not 
the only places when we can do pattern matching, you know, we introduce it about explicit pattern matching for certain scenarios as we have on the first function. We have pattern matching at data structure level that we, now that we introduce keyword lists and we introduce the map that the structure. And we also have the underscore or the catch all scenario for our code, right? So in theory, this is safer, right? I'm mentioning this in theory because, you know, this is some sort of like small functions and most basically poor functions that doesn't depend on anything else, right? Like, you know, IO interactions, database interactions, external HTTP requests. So we can be sure that for now, this is going to be safe, right? And when, or however this code executes, is not going to crash, at least for this particular scenario. But then moving on forward, we can take this to the next step and we're going to be introducing structs. Um, for those that are already familiar with Elixir and the structs, I'm quoting this from the Elixir side as well. Structs are extensions built on top of maps that provide com compile time checks and default values. So in taking into consideration what we were discussing first, right? About treating warnings as errors, and that's basically a compile time check. We're going to be introducing more com time, compile time checks to our code, right? And that's what we actually want for this particular scenario. I I'm going to get more in depth with how when, sorry, with how code we use structs, you know, to get more compile time checks. And that's what we're going to be um, discussing in a little bit, but I call that like a little win, right? Um, something that I found uh, really, really hard to deal with in dynamic languages is that basically you don't have compile time checks, right? Of course, we have linterns, CI tools, um, testing, and more stuff around that. But you know, sometimes uh, it's any uh, it's it's unavoidable to have errors, even without all the testing that you have in place, with all the tools you have in place. So compile time checking is something that's really worth investing your time for. With that in mind, we're going to be introducing this little struct called pet specifically. And we're just going to give a little value or a little key to our struct called pet, right? And in the fifth scenario for our little exercise, we're going to be pattern matching our specific, um, our specific struct, right? So we're going to be really specific about what's going to happen when we receive a pet structure and it's kind variable, it's going to be a binary. So finally, we're going to fall back to our grid scenario once again, and we're going to grid them as always, right? But this little code snippet has some sort of trick right now. Um, it's not going to work per se, and it's done on purpose, right? So in order to, well, or in order to show people what's going to happen when you have this little typo, little mistakes when trying to pattern match and instruct in comparison to pattern matching maps. So this is when you start working on your code, you say, okay, everything is fine, but you have the little fire behind, the fire behind you waiting for the, comp the compile process to finish. So when it's finally done, we're going to have this little error with our new scenario in our code, right? In comparison to just pattern matching different maps, strokes are already, as mentioned, have compile time checks, right? So whenever you have some sort of typo where trying to access those keys, you are going to have an error per se, right? And why is this important? For instance, uh, let's put, um, taking it to the next level, that you're working on your project, you have a lot of structs in your, in your code but you are not pattern matching them, right? So if you start pattern matching them and then you start moving away from those old keys, like for instance, let's say we introduce a data migration, right? Um, kind of moving forward with that uh, using Ecto or any other type of database uh, library. Let's say that we you move or you rename one field to another, right? And of course, if you have tests in place, it's going to crash some way, right? Or maybe you are just going to make the app crash in production. But let's say that you're introducing or you're using all the features that we just spoke um, a few minutes ago. You have pattern matching in place at least for specific structs. We're going to have these sort of errors thrown at compile time. 
And believe me, that's going to be a real lifesaver when trying to migrate all code, you know, paying tech dev, uh, doing database migrations, and some other cases that you want to take into consideration, right? And the more your, your code base grows, the easier is to migrate things when they are correctly used, at least for Elixir in this particular scenario. So finally, um, just to give you some more idea on what's the complete formula of what we are talking in this particular meeting. First one is going to treat the warnings as error, right? So whenever you would like to do this, um, you know, through your CLI or through your project configuration, that's the first step, as I was mentioning, for not having that much dead code, because, you know, one thing is that you don't use something, but um, the compiler is not like, you know, intelligent enough to see how in depth you're not using something, right? For instance, functions or constants or module, module variables and so on and so on. But this is like a first step for a safer elixir in my opinion. That plus exhaustive pattern matching and exhaustive pattern matching is something that I would like to be really, really, really verbose. You know, we could end up with all our functions with partial states or partial functions and that's completely fine, right? We already have safeguard mechanisms built in elixir to sort of tell us that it's going to fail, right? Because of missing scenarios. But I found more safer in my opinion to have exhaustive pattern matching because that could also help us to troubleshoot more issues or to troubleshoot these issues more easily, right? So taking into account our previous example and making it more complicated, let's say that you want to retrieve money for your ATM account or for your ATM, right? And you don't have exhaustive pattern matching, you could have like the fallback scenario that, you know, we try to pass, I don't know, this data and this other data from this function. And we try these different patterns. And of course it failed because we don't have like a fallback scenario for your specific pattern or this specific set of, fun of variables, right? So maybe you, instead of having uh, it crash, you know, gracefully with Elixir's building mechanism, you would like to have, or to consider the fallback scenario and say that to your uh, report, to, sorry, to your error monitoring system, right? Like, you know, rollbar, sentry, or whatever you have in your project. And that's going to help you debug or troubleshoot issues more easily. Now, the next step for this is, of course, having guards. You know, having or using a specific built-in guard for Elixir, it's really good. But the good thing about this is that you're able also to build your own guards, right? You know, you can have more complex checks at compile time, more complex checks for your code. And that's totally good as well, right? For instance, when you're going to publicly expose an API, you want, you know, to have like the first layer or the controller layer to take care of all, you know, the data sanitation stuff, or, you know, to clean up the data in order to work correctly, for instance, right? So with this in mind, at least with these three steps, you are going to be able to do that more safely at least from my perspective, right? When building or to know, for starting up, starting a project from scratch, or maybe you have a greenfield project that you would like to continue working on, but with these different patterns, it's going to be easier the more the, the, more the project is going to scale or the more it's going to grow. And finally, all of these three things with structs are what basically I will recommend using on a daily basis. And that's probably what we all use in our daily basis, right? As we said before, structs not allow us only to do better pattern matching, but it also helps us in the scenario that I was mentioning before, you know, doing refactoring, doing migrations in the database layer with, with you, oh, sorry, using other libraries and more benefits, right? So what we want is to actually avoid trying to, you know, run our test or, you know, trying to test things in, an, in, a, in your local server or maybe in production. So it's safer to have more compile time checks in order to you know, deliver more quality code in the long term. And uh, Struct is kind of like the catch for all these particular scenarios. And also allow us to, you to be more expressive, right? With all the business domain logic that you could have in your application. And summing all this up or using all these different uh, functionalities, uh, settings, and built-in mechanisms in Elixir, that's what I call a safer elixir 
at least from a beginner's standpoint, right? You know, and also as, as the host was introducing, more like a pragmatic error, right? Because the purpose of having all these features and using them separately, it's completely fine as well, right? But using them all together is what I call a safer elixir. And I have known that for a fact, working in projects in elixir for a few years, that this, this really brings more safety, you know, not only to the project itself, to its maturity, but also for the people that are working on the project itself, you know, because some of the things that are hard in software is when introducing someone new to a project that um, if you don't have enough test coverage or you don't have enough tools to, you know, for new people to guarantee them that they are not going to break your system somehow, that's something that I guess we all have dealt with at some point in our careers, right? But, you know, when you have a compiler that's going to back you up with this stuff, it's more easy for new people coming right into your projects. Now, of course, let me talk about the minor, the minor caveats that we have uh, for, you know, for using all these built-in functionalities because, you know, nothing comes without a cost, right? The first one that I would like to mention is the first that we treated, right, um, that we talk about, is treating warnings as errors for your whole project, right? Of course, that's fine, but there's a point when it's not that fine, it becomes troublesome for developers or for people in your project to work on, right? Because for instance, let's say that you're working on a big feature, right? And you, you are introducing variables, you're working on your daily basis, and of course, you're not going to be using them because you know that's not the end state on how your coin is going to end, right? So you have the setting on for local development, it's going to be kind of like a stone in the middle, it's going to be more, um, I don't know, I, I have this idea that somehow in local development, this is going to be more of a trouble in comparison to a help, right? Because um, at least from my perspective, when you're building something new, when you're working on a bug or something related to your project, you don't want that much noise in your code, right? Because you're focusing completely on what you want to do at that moment or what you want to deliver. So my suggestion for these settings or treating warnings as errors will be to do that in your CI in your CI tool, sorry. So your CI basically is going to be the last line in trying to catch all these warnings and avoid them to put them into your project. The second one that I would like to mention is when does it reach the point when you have too many structs, right? So Talking about dynamic languages versus the static languages, the problem with the static languages and their compilers is the more that you have to compile, of course, the more that time is going to take you to compile all your project, right? So there's going to be this point that when you have too many structs, that your project is going to take not that much, but it's going to take a while to compile. But probably that point is something after a hundred or 200 or 300 strokes that you have in your, in your product. And that's going to be somehow fine. I'm just making like this somehow because it's probably going to take up to three, four minutes. And it's not that bad, right? And of course, we also have to take into account circular dependencies that you have across your project, right? For using different strokes, that's basically going to be using different models across your whole code base. And it's going to take a while to compile. But believe me, um, I think the, the cost is worth it because you know, um, at least I haven't found like an, a core application or an application or a project that I have worked on that has more than 400 structs per se. Of course, it has a few dozens, a few hundred of structs, but not that much. So the compile time cost of having this is not going to be that bad. So that's when I suggest, you know, you have to just be waiting for your code to compile, waiting for all the compile time checks to run. And finally, you are going to have your project as safe as you could have, at least only when compiling your code. And something that I was already mentioning, uh, something or a library that already relies a lot on structs is Ecto, right? Because Ecto allows us to model our database tables or, you know, structures into Elixir models, right? So the more models that you have at a business level stored into a database or an external storage, the more com compile time checks that you're going to have. But that's also the more time that you're going to have to wait to spend or to invest in our application or your project to compile. Um, 
And that's the two major things that I would like to mention as caveats or two considerations. But the other thing that I didn't put into this, uh, you know, explicitly into this slide is that the other thing is, is sort of like a mindset, right? Um, because I, I mentioned partial functions at some point. We all know that Elixir is a functional programming, it's a functional programming language, but it's not that all people are really fond of, you know, exhaustive pattern matching or doing or covering all the scenarios in our functions, right? And that also requires a change in the mindset of the people. So introducing this mindset into your project, into the people that you work on, it's something that could probably take more time. And of course, let's say that you already work into a big code base, right? And they weren't treating warnings as errors. So when you turn this setting on, you're probably going to have, uh, I'm just making that up, a few hundred errors. And that's when somebody asks, our, uh, you know, ask ourselves, who wants to take care of those errors, right? Maybe it's safe to do it. Maybe it's not safe to do it. But anyway, it's going to take some time to introduce this into your project, change your mindset, change the mindset of the people in your project. But that's what I suggest from this little talk because that's why that's what I found safer in order to deliver more quality code or more safer code, at least from the Elixir standpoint. Um, yeah. That's pretty much what I have prepared for this little talk. Um, let me check right now uh, the Wava app. I'm going to check for questions. Um, I don't know if anybody in there has any questions, but give me one second to check Wava. Um, yeah, anybody with in-person questions? Uh, Esteban, I think there's probably none on Wava either, right? At least on my yeah, screen. Um, I have one, which is... Um, I mean, you had a couple of items in in that list uh, that you so, that you said sort of you consider constitute safe elixir. Um, is there anything that didn't make it into that list, perhaps? That maybe you were hesitant to to add. I don't know. Um. Well, you know, uh, this is kind of like using only you know, the core of elixir itself. Uh, I think something that's also important to have is automatic testing, of course, BI X unit. That's part of the core as well, right? But it's not that you require to write automated testing or testing in order to make your code safer, right? And in any case, testing is not like the, I would say the panacea of making safer code because you know we also depend on fixtures on different scenarios for our code to work on. And the same goes when you're writing a, a test suit, right? You are going to work based on some assumptions or based on some scenarios. And of course, there's a chance that you're going to slightly miss some of those scenarios. Um, I have seen a few libraries or other approaches that you could maybe do property check, uh, yeah, property tests in Elixir as well, you know, for random inputs and you expect some outputs. That works as well, but um, it's not the panacea as I was mentioning, right, for my opinion, right? Um, it's good to have also test coverage or, you know, it's, it's still all the types of testing that you would like to have for your project, you know, it will it be unit testing, integration testing, or end-to-end -end testing. But this is still not, you know, we're not completely safe from that standpoint. There's something that could slip through those tests, and that's why we have those famous regression tests, right? Um, but yeah, that's what, uh, that's something that I would also like to introduce in here, but not something mandatory, I would say. Definitely something that you will also have to take into account, but not for not so much for comp file time checks at least that's kind of like the core thing that we were discussing right now yeah understood um so some some questions have shown up on on wova um and uh let's go with with the one i have here first um what are your views about libraries like witchcraft and and funland well i, I haven't personally worked with them you know in big projects but that's something to consider as well, right? Uh, for instance, um, let, let's say you like, uh, since we were more focused about using uh, compile time checks, sorry, I'm, I'm just dealing with my phone and web app. So for instance, if you would like to have more compile time checks um, with other uh, libraries that is for testing or for other purposes, instead of using mocks, you know, that's kind of like something to allow you to mock better better in your application for testing. You could use hammocks, right? But it's, uh, as I was mentioning before, it's not like the complete panacea, right? Uh, it always has its considerations. 
it always has its drawbacks, but that's something that you could definitely try in your project to see how it works because no, all the code bases are the same. And of course, you don't have the same, um, uh, I don't know, the same necessities or the same things that you would like to solve, at least for your particular project. Uh, so there's one more question online. Any in-person questions? Okay, so this one is a little long, uh, so I'm going to take my time reading it because uh, my brain is fried and I can't, I can't sort of contract it. Um, <laughs> okay, so what, what's your take on using naked constants uh, or literal values in code? Uh, I like to define constants for them because if you make a typo in the atom or a number, um, the compiler can't catch that. But if you make a typo in a constant name, the compiler will catch it. Also, constant names can hint more about the nature of a value uh, rather than just a naked atom. Mm, well, uh, I actually have, well, uh, when I was working on my previous project in Elixir, we somehow made this into this sort of discussion, not only about namings or constants or module constants, but also the, regarding the use of atoms, right? Uh, atoms, uh, if I'm not mistaken, under the hood at runtime, they are turned into, into integers or into more straightforward values. And the thing about them is that uh, you can actually run out of atoms, right? So the more atoms that you introduce in your code base, it's probably going to make it crash. But uh, yeah, that's why we had this little discussion, right? Um, in relation to your question, using about naked, naked constant, sorry, or literal values in the code, um, I guess it also depends as well, right? Because I'm um, not talking too specifically uh, in Elixir, but instead of having naked constants or something like that, you can somehow try to bring uh, static variables into context with, you know, with predefined modules. And you could have those variables, those static or those constant in, uh, separately in modules, right? Or even so, you could also have them as part of your project's configuration. And you could actually try to take them using um, the application model, you know, to get a specific variable, and that could also somehow try to alleviate the problem, right? But uh, once again, that's kind of like the thing that you have to discuss with your whole team in order to decide what's best, because there's not like a magic formula to decide what's best for a specific project, right? The, only the people that work in in those projects kind of have like you know the better the better reasoning and the better um, the better thoughts or you know, the better mindset to solve that problem. Thanks once again, thanks for your applauses. Uh, uh, this is me, you want to check me on, on GitHub. And of course, uh, I work for Stack Builders. We deliver or, you know, we work on blog posts related to functional programming, static, static programming, oh, sorry, static programming languages and more stuff related to programming. So if you want to check uh, the website or myself in GitHub, more than happy to have a little conversation about those topics as well. And thanks once again, everyone. And thanks, Alicia, for having me having this little talk.